sorry for these technical details, but uh, I think, I mean, if you had technical details today is probably the best talking about stress because that has caused us stress and as well as you on the cardiovascular disease. So hopefully, Ahmed, uh, uh, that would be very germane to what you will be talking about. <laughs> so sorry for, for the delay. And uh, Dr. Tawakol, please, the floor is yours. Can you hear him? Yet relatively little had been known about the mechanisms translating stress to cardiovascular disease. In fact, important studies such as this one in The Lancet 2004 shows that in a study of 25,000 individuals across the world, the attributable risk of stress is substantial after adjusting for cardiovascular disease risk factors. And in fact, it's known that stress can translate to cardiovascular disease risk factors as well. It heightens hypertension, smoking, physical activity, uh, inactivity, and overeating. Yet these factors don't explain the observed risk between stress and cardiovascular disease. Indeed, prior studies and this series of important studies uh, by colleagues at Mass General Hospital have shown that you can induce stress in animal models. For example, if you have mice in a cage, you can shake the cages or put a cat on the cage, all inducing stress in these uh, mice. That stress leads to activation of the bone marrow with the proliferation and release of monocytes. And these immune progenitor cells can go to the spleen where they prepare for the next insult or can continue along their way to induce atherosclerotic inflammation. So the model they put together was stress with progenitor release from the bone marrow niche, splenic activity, arterial inflammation, and myocardial infarction. We asked, if this occurs also in humans. Um, there's, I'm getting background noise. Um, I'm not sure if, if my, my uh, volume is coming across. Um, I would say that there are several aspects that we can test in humans to look at this mechanisms. And indeed, PET-CT, or positron emission tomography with either CT or MRI gives us a unique opportunity to image the entire human system and look at cross-system interactions. So we can image the bone marrow and the spleen and the arterial wall. I'll give you some examples. For example, in this particular study in collaboration with Kerm Nasser, we were able to evaluate bone marrow activity. And you can see here's a patient with high activity and here's a patient with low activity. These bone marrow signals actually associate with circulating markers of inflammation. Moreover, this leukopoietic activity had some prognostic information. For example, in patients with greater than average signals from the bone marrow, the rate of cardiovascular disease events was greater than those with less than average uh, signals. Likewise, we can look at the signal in the arterial wall as a manifestation of inflammation. And in fact, we've previously observed in patients going to endarterectomy surgery that the signals measured by PET-CT prior to surgery predicts the macrophage density. And these findings have actually been replicated by multiple groups. And in fact, now the guidelines use PET-CT, recommend the use of PET-CT for evaluating of our, uh, arterial inflammation, device infection, sarcoidosis, and endocarditis, all measures of inflammation. In fact, this arterial measure also gives us some prognostic information in terms of cardiovascular disease events subsequently. So incident events are heightened in these four studies among the individuals with the highest signals in their large arteries. So I've been able to describe a way to look at much of the system uh, using imaging, but what about the brain? How are we gonna test the brain heart connection 
how are we going to, in fact, first look at the brain? Well, you could use a questionnaire. For example, the perceived stress 10 scale can tell you something about your stress perception over the uh, over a month or so. Uh, I invite you to try uh, a scale such as this. You can look at it, uh, find it on the internet and see where you stand in terms of general stress. But it's well known that one's perception of stress doesn't always align with the physiology of stress. So if one were to then look at the physiology, what would we look at? I'd like to direct your attention to two important areas. First, within the limbic system, the amygdala plays a very important role in potentiating the stress. And then the prefrontal cortex and other cortical structures have an opposite effect. They try to tamp down the effect of stress to evaluate the stressors and uh, realign the relative concern one should have for those stressors. And in fact, one would expect that prefrontal regulation is dominating during non-stress conditions, while amygdala control dominates during stress conditions. I can go beyond that and say that chronic stress actually has impacts on several of these neurological uh, networks. For example, during chronic stress exposure, amygdala uh, neurons will show dendritic growth and uh, persistent spine formation more arborization, for example, whereas the hippocampus uh, will have that reversible dendritic atrophy. And similarly, there will be dendritic atrophy and spine loss within the prefrontal cortex. So chronic stress has a negative impact on cortical structures and on memory as well. We can measure much of this using multimodality imaging. For example, with FDG pad, we can look at neural system activity high amygdala activity relative to counter-regulatory tissue activity, as I described. We can use functional MRI to look at neural activation. We can use structural MRI to look at tissue volumes. And in this particular case, we're looking for amygdala volume loss, representing a reduction of the neurons that are reducing the activity of the amygdala. So with multi-system imaging then, we can look at the brain, we can look at the bone marrow, and we can look at the arteries in the ways that I described, giving us an opportunity to test the system that I just described was evaluated in animals and now needs to be seen and evaluated in humans. We did just that. We sought to test the hypothesis in humans that higher stress neural activity associates with a higher uh, risk of cardiovascular disease. We employed multimodality Im imaging with PET-CT and PET-MR looking at stress-associated neural activity, leukopoietic activity, and arterial inflammation, and then had five years of follow-up for cardiovascular disease events. We ended up with a population of 293 individuals who were stable before imaging, had no evidence of, of active cancer, and were followed for uh, five years. And this is what we found. So first, here are patients with and without subsequent cardiovascular events. And the example patient that I have who did have a cardiovascular event had heightened activity of the amygdala. You can see the frond of the amygdala here relative to counter-regulatory cortical activity. Here's a person with lower amygdala activity and we can actually get the ratio of amygdala to regulatory activity. And here it's 1.02 versus 0.47, for example. This patient with higher stress neural activity had higher bone marrow activity. And if you can see here, the shadow of the aorta with bright red FTG uptake is greater as well. This person had low activity, low bone marrow activity and uh, lower arterial inflammation. And in fact, on average, individuals with higher amygdala activity had more events than those with lower activity. And what was interesting, the higher their activity, the sooner they had their cardiovascular disease events after imaging. So those with cardiovascular events within a year of imaging had the highest activity versus those with later events versus those who did not have events. Moreover, we found through mediation models that stress neural activity linked to cardiovascular disease through a serial pathway involving heightened bone marrow activity and heightened arterial inflammation replicating and extending what was seen in animal models. Those findings were subsequently also validated in other studies. For example, uh, Goyal uh, Meta et al. at the NIH used PET-MR and coronary CTA imaging and observed that the amygdala to cortical activity ratio predicted uh, coronary plaques 
Here they're looking in, in fact with non-calcified plaque volumes. And they also demonstrated that there was heightened leukopoietic activity and in arterial inflammation, and that these signals serially uh, linked the amygdala to the coronary atherosclerosis. Another group more recently looked at amygdala to cortical activity ratio and found also that it associates with arterial inflammation, with bone marrow activity, and with perceived stress. They also demonstrate that people presenting with acute myocardial infarctions have higher activity compared to controls. Moreover, my colleague Mike Os Osborne, in collaboration, uh, tested the same concept that stress neural activity by FDG PET associates with coronary mace, this time in the MGB biobank and in a cohort of 1,500 patients found similar findings as we reported previously. He then went on to extend these observations in the UK biobank, this time with 21,000 patients with MRI. And here you can see those with the lowest amygdala volumes. Again, that's the signal where the counter-regulatory neurons are less active, have the highest myocardial infarction rate compared to those with uh, larger amygdalae. Therefore, using two different biobanks and two different imaging modalities to extend the observation that I mentioned before. Beyond that, Mike Osborne asked, if stress causally relates to cardiovascular disease, then you would hypothesize that a genetic predisposition to stress should independently associate with cardiovascular disease. And in fact, what he did next was to look at a polygenic risk score that uh, predicts stress syndromes. And if you take this polygenic stress sensitivity risk score, you can see that as you increase the risk for uh, stress syndromes, your cardiovascular disease rate goes up. He first looked at the MGB biobank in 18,000 patients and next used the UK biobank in 252,000 patients and saw very significant uh, correlations between the genes for stress and cardiovascular disease events. Next, he asked whether those genes for stress predict the brain manifestations that I've described before. And indeed, he found that. So as the genetic risk for stress syndromes increase, the stress neural activity increases and in the UKB for MRI structural findings, he found the same kinds of findings, this time with lower amygdala volumes as your stress uh, polygenic risk score increases. Moreover, he then used um, mediation analysis to demonstrate that the genetic predisposition to stress links to cardiovascular disease events through changes in amygdala phenotype. So you can put together a neuroimmune arterial axis model whereby stress impacts the amygdala, leads to increased sympathetic nervous system activity and the leukocyte progenitors release, the greater plaque burden, more atherosclerotic inflammation, and subsequent cardiovascular disease events. I do want to add a very uh, recent paper that came out of Nature where they extend this concept and introduce something they call a neuroimmune atherosclerotic uh, in, uh, interface. And in this particular case, they describe artery tertiary lymphoid organs. Now stay with me for a minute as I describe this because this is a relatively new concept. So this lymphoid organ basically describes um, inflammatory cells on the adventitial surface, uh, surface of uh, atherosclerotic vessels. And in fact, these leukocytes appear to be most prominently located around areas of uh, uh, atherosclerotic plaques. Alongside of these, there is sympathetic nervous system innervation. So a lot of nerves that are then touching the leukocytes there, and actually they used imaging to demonstrate that the nerve terminals were in communication with the inflammatory cells. And they also demonstrate that the more atherosclerosis there was, there was more of these axons. Moreover, they then injected dye and um, rabies uh, virus, uh, modified rabies virus. And what they observed was that the communication from these ATLOs or artery tertiary lymphoid or organs was through the spinal column to the central nucleus of the amygdala. So they, then they call this an artery brain circuit because they were also able to, de uh, to demonstrate that the sympathetic nerves went back 
to the um, ATLOs through ganglia. And the next thing they did was very interesting. They showed that interrupting this artery brain circus, uh, circuit attenuates atherosclerosis. So for example, uh, if they did a celiac ganglionectomy, they found that the plaque size and plaque vulnerability indices were reduced. Another concept I wanna add is that acute mental stress or acute stress can lead to acute is ischemia and it's important ischemia. So here's a study that was recently published by Vaccarino et al, where they had several hundred patients undergo conventional exercise stress tests and mental stress tests, after which they did myocardial perfusion imaging for, to test the effect of each of these stressors on myocardial blood flow. For the mental stress, they had public speaking or a math challenge in front of people who were um, listening. And what they found is that over a six year observation period, individuals who manifested no ischemia had the lowest event rate, followed by individuals who demonstrated some level of ischemia with conventional stress, but even more so for people who had mental stress ischemia. And then of course, people who had the combination of the two forms of ischemia had the highest event rate. So mental stress ischemia is clinically important. I can put this together and propose a model by which stress will lead to um, HPA axis acti uh, activation, where the pituitary is producing ACTH. You can see uh, um, activation of the uh, adrenal gland with cortisol epinephrine release. Sympathetic nervous system also potentiates this. In fact, the sympathetic nervous system activity is very important in several ways in that it increases that leuco leucopoiesis from the bone marrow. It also triggers uh, the microvascular dysfunction that leads to ischemia and also potentiates the uh, triggering of these uh, artery tertiary lymphoid organs. All of these lead to increased inflammation and collude to increase cardiovascular disease risk. So I've been talking now about the impact of stress on cardiovascular disease. What about chronic stressors? Uh, I wanna differentiate stress from stressors. Um, and, and, and two very well studied stressors include low socioeconomic status and chronic noise. And we know that both of them associate with cardiovascular disease and with stress. So we hypothesize that the stress associated pathways partially mediate the link between noise and socioeconomic deprivation and cardiovascular disease. So for example, we've long known that lower socioeconomic status will associate with an earlier death. For example, individuals in the first quartile of income die sooner than individuals with higher income. And this is a repeatable observation no matter when it's been studied. In fact, the differences between the upper and lower quartile and age of death continue to get wider. Similarly, change in income associates with an increase in cardiovascular disease. So here's a cohort where the income dropped and they had the highest uh, evidence of cardiovascular disease compared to those without a change in income or with an income rise. And these changes and differences persist after adjusting for risk factors, healthcare access, and importantly, income at the beginning of the study. So we tested this in our cohort to assess the impact of income and some of the brain changes. And let me walk you through this. So the first thing we did is looked at the association between income and survival free from MACE. And you can see here, those with the lowest income had the highest event rate. The next thing we did is look at income versus the brain measures. And here you can see low income with higher stress neural activity compared to higher income. So low income with higher activity of the stress centers. This lower income also associated with higher arterial inflammation. And in fact, when we then conducted an analysis using mediation models, we found that the link between socioeconomic status and major adverse cardiovascular disease events was in part mediated through a serial pathway that involved heightened activity of the stress neural centers, heightened bone marrow activity, and heightened arterial inflammation in series leading to MACE. Similarly, we were interested in the association between noise and cardiovascular disease. 
And we've long been interested in noise because it's well known that higher noise exposure associates with several diseases, cardiometabolic disease, and importantly, cardiovascular disease events. And there are elegant studies that show that there is heightened sympathetic nervous system activity and inflammation, higher thrombosis, all leading to greater cardiometabolic disease. But the question we had is how does noise exposure initiate those pathobiological processes in the first place in humans? We tested that in uh, using our brain imaging approach. And the first thing we observed is like many other studies, we found that those exposed to greater noise, here we use the World Health Organization uh, threshold, those with greater noise, had greater diseases, a uh, burden of, of uh, MACE compared to those with lower noise exposure. Next, we imaged the brains and we found that those with lower exposure to noise had lower stress neural activity compared to those with higher exposure to noise. And finally, we, we demonstrate through mediation analysis that noise links to MACE through a serial pathway that involves the brain and heightened arterial inflammation. And in retrospect, that shouldn't be shocking that noise initiates these pathways through the brain. The next question we asked is, to what degree is it the stress exposure versus the brain response? And let me quickly take you through this. And first, I'll say that we keep on appreciating that as you can count stressors through a population, the more of these stressors that you find, the higher the uh, amygdalar activity or stress neural activity. So here in our, our population, we were able to reproducibly uh, um, measure income, crime exposure, and noise as stressors that have been associated with um, heightened brain activity and disease events. And we find, again, as you increase the number of these stressors, there's a heightening in the uh, brain activity on average. But again, that's on average. And what we found is that there are folks who are exposed to stressors, but have routine or uh, unimpressive neurobiological activity. Let's call them neurobiologically resilient. On the other hand, there are individuals who are exposed to these stressors and have higher activity. We'll, we'll say that they're less neurobiologically resilient. Now, this aspect of neurobiological resilience is important because it turns out that it actually determines outcomes among stress exposed. So among the individuals who are stress exposed, if the amygdala activity is not uh, increased, they have a relatively low event rate. Compared to those with higher stress neurobiological activity, they have a higher event rate. So it's not simply your exposure to stressors, it's what your brain does in response to that exposure. So that takes me to the next topic around acute stressors. So we've long known that acute stress can lead to cardiovascular disease events. And in fact, here is a well-traveled slide from the famous Northridge earthquake study where they demonstrate that on the day of the earthquake, January 17, 1994, there was a large increase in uh, coronary artery deaths confirmed through pathology. And you can see here, 1992 and 1993, a very predictable rate of events uh, um, around 15 to 20 deaths from cardiovascular disease on these days from, from um, uh, coronary occlusive disease. Whereas on the day of the earthquake, there was this big jump. So it doesn't take an earthquake. It can also be something like the World Cup. So here's another uh, well-known study published also in the New England Journal of Medicine. They looked at the cardiovascular event rates in Germany uh, in three different years, including 2006, which is when the World Cup was played in Germany. And what's interesting here, you can see the peaks of these events that occurred on the days of home teams. Not only that, the highest peaks occurred during an exciting quarterfinal uh, win after a dramatic penalty shootout. And then another one here during a tight semifinal game loss. And then the next game was a consolation third place game where the event rate is back into the backgrounds and there's barely a blip when the finals were played without the home team. So you can see even something like the whole World Cup can be associated with peaks in events.
More recently, there are papers that have looked at a surge in cardiovascular disease events after elections. And here you can see with the 2016 election and the 2020 election, both cases, there was a significant increase in uh, acute cardiovascular disease events. What about more classic um, disease events triggered by stress? And of course, Takotsubo syndrome is one of those well-known uh, classic stress-associated syndromes, usually reversible heart failure syndrome, often triggered by an acute emotional or physical stressor. What we've known from prior studies, and here's an important study uh, published in the European Heart Journal in 2019, where they looked at patients who had Takotsubo. They found 15 patients with a history of Takotsubo and compared it to 39 controls. And importantly, what they found is that those with Takotsubo had impaired cortical limbic connectivity notably involving the amygdala and prefrontal cortex. But because this looked at patients with prior Takotsubo, it wasn't clear if it was a result of or a cause of the syndrome. So we did a study where we had 41 individuals who had brain imaging before developing Takotsubo and 63 matched controls. And you can see some of the brain imaging signals. We were very focused on the amygdala relative to the prefrontal cortex and looking for the subsequent development of Takotsubo. And first, what we observed is as a group, those who developed subsequent Takotsubo had greater stress neural biological activity compared to controls. So the stress neural network of those with Takotsubo was slightly increased, but there's a range. And in fact, you can see that there are those outliers who have a greater than one standard deviation increase in the signal compared to the others who are also destined to develop Takotsubo. What we found here was, was interesting to us because those with lower activity had Takotsubo later, about two to three years after imaging, whereas those with the highest activity had Takotsubo within less than a year after imaging. So the question that comes to us is, why would the brain signal have anything to do with the classic Takotsubo if you were to buy the classic teaching that it happens upon exposure to a dreadful once in a lifetime stressor? Why would your brain predict the timing of, uh, of your interaction with a stressor like that? Well, it turns out that first of all, there were several individuals who died, who, who developed Takotsubo after uh, exposure to one of these dreadful stressors, such as one patient had Takotsubo a week after her son died unexpectedly. Another one, a day or two after uh, given a diagnosis of terminal cancer. Another one on the one year anniversary of her spouse's death. On the other hand, we had plenty of patients who had minor stressors such as uh, Takotsubo after diarrhea or after a screening colonoscopy. And in fact, when we put it all together, we hypothesized that chronic stress associated neural activity uh, um, will give you a higher susceptibility to activation by stressful events. So if your amygdala relative to the prefrontal cortex is highly active, your stress network is more susceptible to being triggered in response to exposure to any of these triggers, whether it's socioeconomics, marital stress, watching the World Cup, earthquake, or difficulty at work. All of this could lead to heightened sympathetic system surge, inflammation, hypercoagulability, and a greater risk of ACS, sudden death, arrhythmia, or Takotsubo, as I mentioned before. Now that we've talked about all of the stress, how about lowering the stress? Well, there are studies that show that stress reduction are, is useful. So for example, this study by Blumenthal et al. showed that in a population randomized to standard cardiac rehab or cardiac rehab plus that stress reduction, and then were followed for five years, they found that stress reduction reduced stress, anxiety, and depressed mood. No surprise there. What was fascinating was that, first of all, those with neither intervention had the highest event rate. And then of course, as we would expect, those with cardiac rehab with exercise had a risk, risk reduction compared to those with no cardiac rehab. However, there was an additional reduction 
with roughly 50% relative risk reduction among those who had the addition of stress reduction on top of exercise cardiac rehab, indicating that the addition of stress reduction may actually reduce cardiovascular disease events. Now, again, this was a relatively small study, needs further uh, confirmation. We're also evaluating the impact of several different stress reduction techniques uh, using our MGD biobank and brain imaging. So we have 51,000 uh, participants, 50,000 of which gave us lifestyle data, and we have a subset with brain imaging. One of the things we're looking at, for example, is moderate alcohol intake. And I'll start by saying that like many other groups, we've seen this J-shaped association between alcohol and cardiovascular mace events. Uh, low, low alcohol intake has a um, um, predictable rate of cardiovascular disease events, followed by moderate alcohol intake, where we see a reduction, and then it goes back up with high uh, alcohol intake. What's interesting is when we look at the overall MACE events, we see a substantial reduction, uh, and most of the components of MACE are also redu reduced with um, alcohol intake. And in fact, the associations we see here persist after excluding abstainers. In other words, we exclude the possibility of the abstainer effect. But before anyone gets too excited about these findings, I want to point out that cancer risk goes up. What's notable, we also found a substantial reduction in the uh, stress neural activity among individuals who drank moderately compared to those who drink a low amount of alcohol. And we found that this stress neural activity is mostly impacted through reductions in amygdala activity. So it's not that alcohol has increased the prefrontal cortical activity, there was a non-significant change in that, but rather there was a significant reduction in the amygdala activity. And through mediation models, we find that moderate activity leads to a reduction in MACE in part through these changes in the brain, notably through the amygdala. So we would say that moderate alcohol associates with decreased CVD risk by attenuating stress-related pathways, but that there is no safe level of alcohol. And I wanna emphasize that we need therapies that reduce these neural mechanisms without the side effects of alcohol which takes me to exercise. So in this cohort, we also looked at um, the 53,000 or so individuals uh, who provided exercise data. And what we found is what many other studies have found that as you increase exercise, there's a reduction in cardiovascular disease events. Now, if you look at the adjusted MACE risk, you see something that many other studies have found that there is a very nice reduction in events after which it no longer seems to have much of, a, of an impact on cardiovascular disease events beyond a certain uh, level. And, and actually this threshold here comports with the exercise guidelines. Uh, this is roughly equivalent here with 150 minutes and here 300 minutes of moderate intensity exercise per week. And that's actually why the exercise guidelines were given within that range because there's that steep reduction within that range after which there's not much of an additional benefit. Now, what about the brain? What we found here was that there was a nice dose response in terms of the reduction of the neural activity. This dose response was associated with a non-significant decrease in amygdala activity, but with a significant increase in prefrontal cortical activity. So it looks like exercise really increases prefrontal cortical activity and in turn reduces the um, uh, stress neural activity. And in, found, in fact, we found that the association between physical activity and MACE was in part through the brain, about 10% of the overall effects on MACE associated with the brain. Now this is based on a, an imaging study and so we wanted to ask if these findings were true, if they were represented important physiology, then we would hypothesize that exercise should have a larger impact on MACE risk among individuals with chronically heightened stress neural activity, for example, those with depression. And in fact, in 50,000 individuals, we found just that. So look at these data here. These are 10 year events and uh, incident event events after um, entry into the biobank. And in either case, you found, we found that exercise um, is, has a greater impact on cardiovascular disease risk and depression and might be actually double that 
for the uh, general population. And you can see the significant differences and the interaction term for depression impacting uh, the, the uh, effectiveness of exercise on cardiovascular disease risk reduction. So I'd like to summarize that stress is a common and important risk factor for cardiovascular disease, that the attributable risk is on par with hypertension, smoking, dyslipidemia. It associates with higher stress-associated neural network activity, leukopoiesis, systemic inflammation, arterial inflammation, and plaques. And in fact, uh, they all collude to heightened cardiovascular disease events. The impact is modifiable and large trials are needed to prove causation and determine the efficacy of interventions. But for now, I would recommend that for in individuals with high atherosclerotic risks and a high stress, it's reasonable to recommend stress reduction approaches, exercise, and better sleep. Thank you very much for your attention. That was really phenomenal. Um really a tour de force and a state of the art of where we are in this field of stress, stress-mediated cardiovascular disease. Thank you really, Ahmed, for, for this phenomenal uh, presentation. Uh, we have some questions here. The first one is from Dr. Al Malah, who you know very well. He said, uh, great talk, uh, Ahmed, and great to have you with us. Is the effect of stress more on inflammation, like FDG uptake, or microvasculature, myocardial flow reserve? And do we have data on de-stressing, reducing vascular FTG uptake, or improving, you know, flow reserve? I had a hard time um, understanding what you were asking there. I couldn't really hear it well. I'll, I'll do it again. Can you hear me now? A, a little bit, yes. All right. Uh, the question is, is the effect more on inflammation or the microvasculature like flow reserve? That's a really good question. So I, I, would, I would say that there are multiple pathways. So clearly the leukopoiesis that results from the sympathetic nervous system activity is going to be very important. There's a heightened inflammation. Uh, there is a heightened cardiovas uh, cardiometabolic diseases as well, and they will collude to increase ischemia and, and uh, uh, microvascular uh, dysfunction. But in addition, the important impacts on the sympathetic nervous system will contribute to that as well. They'll contribute directly through um, uh, acute impairments in coronary flow and causing uh, microvascular dysfunction, but will also uh, contribute to that through the um, artery tertiary uh, lymphoid organs, the artery brain circuit. So there are multiple pathways that will lead to the abnormalities uh, that are seen in terms of both inflammation and the micro microvasculature. Um, and in fact, I can extend that further. So um, I've, I've described those pathways, but beyond that, there are the increases in the risk factors that also contribute to those pathways. So uh, let me ask you a question to try to understand it here. Is um, the central nervous system, particularly the amygdala activity, is that the main trigger that would change many things? Obviously, the uh, bone marrow, the white cells, the inflammation at the... Uh, is this the main pathway with multiple uh, different uh, uh, factors, if you so will? This, yeah, no, really good question. So the central uh, the nucleus of the amygdala clearly plays a very important role um, in modulating the output of the sympathetic nervous system. But I, I, I would say that in many of the models that I described, it's, it's really the brainstem activity that's highly influenced by the amygdala that seems to trigger some of these down, downstream responses in addition to the HPA axis activity. So there's, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm very cautious about uh, pinning too much on the amygdala per se, because whenever we look at it and the more we stretch it out, it's, it's really a network of brain structures that, that collude. Um, and it often reflects a balance or rather an imbalance uh, between several of those structures. But if, if one wants to start off with an initial understanding, I think it's fair to say that central nucleus of the amygdala is playing a very important role and then uh, through, through more 
further uh, uh, assessment of this, uh, kind of consider that there are many ways to get to an imbalance of the system. For example, what we see in PTSD, um, it's driven largely not necessarily by heightened amygdala activity, but through um, a pathological inactivity of the um, prefrontal cortex on exposure to stressors. And that's that deficit of prefrontal control tends to be the determining factor of atherosclerotic uh, disease complications. Likewise, in depression, and it's linked to cardiovascular disease, it seems, again, it's the prefrontal loss more than the hyperactivity of the amygdala. And I know you didn't ask this question per se, but I will kind of uh, add this. I remember learning early on from one of my colleagues in psychiatry who uh, was telling me that, um, you know, it, uh, he would bet that most of us on this call today uh, are have at least um, average, if not above average, functioning amygdala. So we might see ourselves as people who are uh, controlling our stress well and able, therefore, to manage as physicians. But it's not because our amygdala are less active. In fact, if your amygdala were amygdala were less active, you may be less ready to respond to threats, uh, less able to respond to uh, abnormal labs or patient symptoms. What you really need to count on is a vigilant amygdala with a very robust prefrontal cortex and other cortical structures that are constantly controlling hyperactivity of the amygdala. And so what we need to do is to make sure to maintain that integrity of the cortical structures. And I would say a lot of the things that I discussed, notably um, good exercise, really maintains that. Now, I showed some studies here, but there are other studies. And in fact, there's a beautiful literature about exercise and its effect on the uh, prefrontal cortex as it impacts cognitive function. And so that's a very well uh, studied literature, uh, the impact on cognitive function. So I would say there's an interplay between the, these cognitive aspects and, uh, and the stress neural activity. I mean, it, it really is amazing how complex the situation is. There are so many different factors. And I was fascinated also by the resilience that you talked about uh, in, in those chronic stressors, if you will maybe something that we could learn from these people who, who were able to be resilient compared to the others who were not. I have a question. I, I was fascinated by the ATLO, you know, the artery tertiary lymphoid organ. Is this throughout our vasculature or is it in certain areas of the vasculature? So this is a relatively new concept uh, that, that Nature paper I described came out the week before last. So very new, uh, but very exciting concept. Uh, in that particular study, they found it throughout the large vessels that they looked at. So uh, abdominal organs, um, uh, the abdominal aorta and thoracic aorta. And you know, I met very well that uh this center is also interested in the effect of nature on uh, relaxation and probably cardiovascular health. Any studies regarding that as part of um, de-stressing? <laughs> Ab absolutely. So there, there are um, multiple studies that show that um, the walking outside uh, makes a big impact and importantly uh, just your green space measures can predict your stress response um, it's it's a very interesting literature I guess it need, what what one needs to uh, compare is um, is it because you're exposed to more relaxing environments uh, or is it that it's less noisy as well there are lots of considerations uh, but in any case, when I think about exercise, I, 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 um, I do recognize that any exercise is good. And clearly, uh, when we look at the impact on the brain, we didn't differentiate the forms of exercise. We just looked at the metabolic equivalents produced by these exercises. But if I had my druthers, I would love to study a little more nuance and ask if it's a specific kind of exercise. For example, if you had a similar number of metabolic equivalents from boxing versus a beautiful bike ride in green space, 
would one have a better impact on these stress structures than the other? I'm, exactly. I'm not sure. Exactly. A, a treadmill in the gym in front of, uh, you know, news <laughs> versus a, uh, a run outside in the park, I think, will be, <laughs> will be very interesting. Uh, one question here came, are there any data on heart rate variability response to stress as a measure of the uh, network activity, the neural network activity? Um, so it is. Yeah, we're, hard, yeah. we're we're looking at that, and I can say from our preliminary findings, we do find that 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 uh, these stress neural um, findings do associate with heart rate variability. <clears throat> of course, uh, what I say by this is that the less variable your heart rate is, the more of sympathetic versus parasympathetic activity uh, is, is there. And so that can give you some insights into the uh, sympathetic system as it, as it might um, associate with some of these endpoints. And many groups are using heart rate variability. The, the problem with using it as a, as a measure, though, is that in many of our patients at risk, they're taking medications that alters this signal. But for patients who are not on, uh, individuals who are not on medications that alter the signal, heart rate variability can give you important insights into your sympathetic nervous system activity and hence your stress response. Well, that, that was truly fascinating. And I cannot thank you enough for joining us today. Hopefully, uh, we will see you in, in person in Houston sometime soon. And uh, I think uh, really congratulations on so many contributions, you and your colleagues in this field that is fascinating to everyone truly, because that's always a question in, in, in the background. There is no question that there is effect of, of stress in various modalities and various modes on the cardiovascular system and probably also the neurological system. And I think the more we can mitigate it and, and try to reduce it certainly, you know, the healthier we are. Thank you again, and uh, have a wonderful day. Thank you, Dr. Zogby. Thank you very much for the invitation, and uh, it's great to see you. A pleasure.